morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we're still waiting for a few more people to, to join onto the, the webinar. Um, just in the, the meantime, um, just some housekeeping rules. So um, all of your microphones will be kept off. And if you can keep them off um, while we're doing this, it will help with uh, any background interference. Um, and there is an option at the during uh, the, the presentation, you can um, look on the bottom, there's a Q&A box. You're very welcome to write any questions that you have there about the presentation, uh, and I'll try my best to answer them all at the end of the presentation. The presentation is about 20 minutes long, um, and essentially going to run through some basic frog biology, um, the amphibian crisis around the world, little bit about what we at EWT are, are doing in the Threatened Amphibian Program, uh, and then also just some fun froggy facts uh, to, to teach you more about frogs. Um, so thanks very much. This is our first in the Wild Chat series, and it's also my first webinar, so forgive us if uh, there's any glitches, um, but we are very excited to welcome you here, and uh, thanks very much for attending. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. We're now at 11 o'clock on the dot, so we can, can get going. Okay, so I've run through those, those groundkeeping rules. Um, there's also a, a raise your hand option on Zoom, um, but please don't use that. Um, as I say, just actually type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Okay, so uh, again, welcome to our Wild Chat presentation, uh, Fabulous Frogs. Um, I'm Jean Tarrant. I am the manager for the Threatened Amphibian Program of the Endangered Wildlife Trust. We have been running since 2012 and we operate around the country looking at threatened frog species and implementing conservation projects on these. I'll talk a bit more about that a little later. So just to start with some very basic biology, what are frogs? So frogs are, of course, vertebrates. So they're animals with a backbone. They belong to the group of amphibians. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about what it is to be an amphibian just now. And they are not reptiles. So many people will group amphibians and reptiles together. In fact, the study of these creatures is grouped together called herpetology, literally meaning the study of creepy crawly animals, um, but they're not creepy crawly. I've been working on them for about 12 years now, and um, as the, the talk is titled, they really are fantastic uh, and fascinating. So just uh, some things that make them different from reptiles. Reptiles have scales, and reptiles mostly lay eggs that are in hard shells. Amphibians' eggs do not have shells. Uh, they're normally laid in a jelly-like substance, and frogs, reptiles, do not have scales. They have smooth skin. It's a semi-permeable skin, which is um, really key to their entire um, way of functioning uh, in the environment. So a key feature of being an amphibian is this amphibious life cycle. So this two-phase life cycle, where in a typical case, uh, most amphibians will use both the water and the land during their life cycle, typically with adults uh, coming together to mate and uh, lay their eggs in water or near to water, and then uh, developing from egg two tadpole phases. There are about 38 different phases of tadpole development, uh, and then all the way back through to the adult frog. Um, and so that's the typical life cycle of amphibians and all amphibians exhibit this life cycle. There are in fact three different groups of amphibians, not just the frogs, although the frogs are the ones uh, that we are most familiar with. They're the only group of amphibians we have here in South Africa, um, and it's the largest group of amphibians globally. So around the world, there are over 7,000 different species of amphibian, and they occur everywhere around the world, um, except in Antarctica, where it's too cold for them. Uh, and a couple of the isolated islands, like the Galapagos Islands, for example, we don't find frogs there. 
again, because those uh, permeable skins of theirs have not allowed them to actually uh, make long distances across uh, salty water. So frogs cannot live uh, in the ocean, uh, it's too salty for them. Uh, here in South Africa, we have about 135 different species of frog. Then up in the Northern Hemisphere, we get the salamanders. These are the tailed amphibians. So they may look like lizards, but they also have that two-phase life cycle using both water and land uh, during their, their lifespan. And there are about 740 species of these. We find them only in the Northern Hemisphere, Europe and North America, um, Canada. Uh, we do get some in Africa, but this is right at the top of Africa in Morocco. Then there's this funny group called Sicilians. They look like earthworms, they behave like earthworms, they spend most of their time underground, um, but they do in fact have a backbone, uh, they're a vertebrate, and again they have that amphibious life cycle. We know of about 200 odd species of these, and these occur in South America, um, Central Africa, and Asia. So around the world today, and this number grows every day when I check on it, um, we have over 8,000 different species of amphibian. So one of the questions I often get asked is what is the difference between a frog and a toad? So a toad is a type of frog. It's one of the families of frogs, uh, it's the Bifonidae, um, but they do look a bit different from a typical frog. So they have this glandular or bumpy skin um, and they're much more adapted to spending more time on land um, so they actually have a different way of, of walking. They don't take big long leaps because they don't have long limbs like, like many of the other frogs. And um, they also lay these long strings of eggs. A single female can actually lay 20,000 eggs in one evening. So they are a bit different to your typical frog, but they're just one of the families. And here in South Africa, we actually have 12 different families of frog. Uh, and you can just see from that snapshot that they exhibit a wide range of body shapes, colors, patterns, uh, and this represents the habitats that they inhabit. Um, and so we have frogs in forests, we have frogs on mountains, grasslands, streams, uh, and even through to, to desert habitats. So just some fun frog facts for you. A group of frogs is called an army. The average lifespan of a frog is surprisingly long, uh, 4 to 15 years, um, but actually in captivity, some frogs like the platanas have been known to live up to 40 years old. Um, so that's pretty long lived for a relatively small creature. And if you were a frog, your tongue would reach down to your waist. And the reason that frogs have these long sticky tongues is because they depend primarily on insects for their diet. Uh, and they're really good at flicking these tongues off very quickly um, to catch the insects that they eat. Um, so we have some very interesting uh, beliefs about frogs in this country. And one of those is that frogs actually shoot lightning out of their mouths. This is not true, but it may be uh, that this belief comes from the fact that frogs have these awesome long sticky tongues. So we find amphibians all around the world, as I've mentioned, uh, except uh, the very coldest reaches. Um, you can see from this map that South America is really the place where we find the most frogs. Uh, and this is because it's warm and moist and there's lots of habitats available for them there in the rainforest. So if you're really interested in frogs, uh, South America is the, the place to go. Um, but here in South Africa, we have about 135 different species of frogs. And that's not bad considering that most of our country is largely a dry country. So we can find the most frogs uh, in, on the KwaZulu-Natal coast. Zululand is really the best place to go frogging. Uh, and that's again because it's warm, it's wet, uh, and there's this wide variety of habitats available um, to inhabit. So amphibians as a group have been on the planet for a very, very long time. Um, their common ancestor, as we call it, literally called up on about 350 million years ago. Um, and this is what has enabled them to inhabit all of those different places around the Earth and come up with all those different body forms, allowing them to adapt to 
the different ecosystems. I like to compare that to how long humans have been around, and that's about 200,000 years. So this group of animals have been on the planet and have been very successful for a very long time. They were around before the dinosaurs, and they survived the extinction of the dinosaurs. But what we're seeing now is that amphibians are facing a mass extinction themselves, and they are, in fact, the group of animals um, that are the most threatened uh, and faced with extinction. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that a bit later. So what frogs brought with them uh, when they literally crawled onto land was this amazing ability to move. And as I say, typically frogs have these amazing long legs which allow them to jump incredible distances. And this is primarily to get away from, from predators, um, but obviously also helps them to move around. And so while we associate frogs often with their breeding habitats, wetlands, streams, rivers, that kind of thing, they actually can move considerable distances, up to kilometers away from, from water bodies. Yeah, in South Africa, our sharp-nosed grass frog literally holds the world record for, for the longest jump. Uh, and this little chap, he looks quite big in the picture, but he's about five centimeters. You can see he's very powerful uh, with those hind legs. Uh, and the world record for frog jumping is based on um, three consecutive jumps and um, the little grass frog jumped 10.3 meters in those jumps, far outweighing the large American bullfrogs that it was competing against. If you were a frog, you could jump over the length of a rugby field. So on average, frogs can jump 33 times the length of their body, um, really just quite incredible. So that was a nice chorus of, of frog calls that we were listening to there. Uh, and this is one of the things that amphibians brought to us as well, and that's the ability to communicate. And so it's really uh, an amazing way for us to be able to identify frogs. Each species has its own unique call. And so we can listen to a chorus like that and be able to pick out which frogs are actually uh, calling there. Um, we call this the advertisement call. It's only the males that call. Females are actually quiet. Uh, and what males do to make that sound typically is they have this um, vocal sac and they blow it up. And even a tiny two centimeter frog can make really a huge noise that can carry um, kilometers in some cases. So we use um, this not only, just, not only to identify frogs in different places, but we also use the calls of frogs to monitor them. And so with our work on threatened species, for example, we listen to the calling and we use these automated recording devices um, to, to monitor um, frog activity and try and gauge trends in populations in some of our threatened species. So just some more fun facts for you. Uh, the biggest frog in the world is the Goliath frog, aptly named. This is an endangered species from West Africa. You can see they get really huge. Uh, they can get up to three kilograms. Um, so really substantial species. Um, as you can see, they are quite popular for, for the food trade, and this is why they are endangered. Um, but there's really interesting research going on in these frogs. And they have recently found that the males of these frogs can actually shift large river rocks around. These rocks weigh up to two, two kilograms, and they actually build nests out of rocks. Uh, and these very fast flowing, very big rivers where they live, they create these small pools um, where the females can come and lay the eggs, and the tadpoles can develop uh, in a little pool rather than getting washed away in the river. So, quite a, an interesting species. Yeah, in South Africa, the biggest frog is, of course, our giant bullfrog, which we find up in, in Gauteng, Limpopo, and um, central southern Africa. Um, and you can see they are big round frogs. They spend most of their time underground. They only come out uh, once a year in the rainy season, usually between November and January. Um, and they can actually spend up to seven years underground. So they're our biggest frog, but they're also actually the second biggest frog species in the world. 
On the other end of the scale, the smallest frog is this little chap um, from Papua New Guinea, um, reaching a whopping seven millimeters, so really the size of your pinky nail. Um, not only is it the smallest frog on the planet, it's the smallest vertebrate, so the smallest animal to have a backbone. So to think that there's an entire skeleton and all the organs needed to function by a vertebrate animal all packed into this tiny seven millimeters is really quite fascinating. In South Africa, the northern moss frog, which we found in the Western Cape, is our smallest species, and that gets up to 14 millimeters, so still pretty tiny. Right, so one of the key features of frogs uh, and linked to the, that permeable skin of theirs is that they all need fresh water. So no matter what habitat that they live in, whether it is purely in water, so for example, our platanas, um, the African clawed frogs, they spend most of their time in water and they really only move out of water if there's heavy rain. So you can see the flattened body, very smooth skin, um, and, and the full webbing on their back feet. The, this species is really fully adapted to a very aquatic, watery um, lifestyle. On the other end of the scale, we get our desert rain frogs, which occur up in the Northern Cape. That little chap's burrowing down. So they spend most of their time in burrows under, under the sand so that they don't dry out and they don't uh, face the harsh conditions. That's what he looks like um, out of the burrow. Um, and these have really special adaptations to living in such a dry climate. They have a very thin skin on the belly so that it can absorb water. Um, and as I say, they spend most of their time underground um, away from the heat. So we can see that frogs use a huge variety of habitats and are adapted to those. Um, and again, this need for water goes back to needing to complete that development from egg to tadpole, which we call metamorphosis. Amphibians are the animal, the biggest animal that go through such a complete change. And they literally go from a vegetarian tadpole, uh, which has um, mouth parts for grazing, but it doesn't have a skeleton. And over time, it develops limbs um, and a full skeleton, and then turns into this insect-eating carnivore that can now hop around on land. So it's really quite an incredible transformation that can take anything between a couple of weeks or up to two years, depending on, on the species. So as we've seen through the habitats, um, the variation on, on frog eggs just in themselves is, is very wide. So some frogs lay their eggs up in branches or on rocks. Some actually make uh, nests out of leaves. Some make foam nests by kicking their legs together. Um, typical frogs lay their eggs in or close to water. And I've mentioned the toads that lay these very long strings of eggs. So we can even identify different frog species um, by their eggs. And we actually use in the top left there, the egg clumps of the endangered clue frog to monitor that species in KwaZulu-Natal with the help of school groups and, and honorary officers uh, in some of the Ezembelo reserves. Back to, to one of the rain frog species. Um, this just shows that um, this species doesn't actually have a free swimming tadpole phase. So they use these burrows underground, they lay their eggs in these nests underground. Those develop while in the nest, just with the froth from, from the water uh, in the nest. Um, and then there's complete development underground. So this is one of our, our rain frog species. Uh, tadpoles, we also get a wide um, range of the way tadpoles look depending on species. And we can also identify a species of frog based on its tadpole. So for example, there at the top, we see very small dark tadpoles. These are typically toad tadpoles. And we can look at all kinds of characteristics like the tail legs, the mouth parts, um, in this case, the platana on the left has these long tentacles and swims at, a, at an angle in the water, very easy um, species to identify from its tadpole. And then on the right, we have a table mountain ghost frog tadpole. This is one of the critically endangered species that we are studying on Table Mountain. And we're looking particularly at the tadpole and how, how this 
how the tadpole moves between pools and we're monitoring that species by looking at the tadpoles. But you can see it has a really huge head with many rows of teeth that it uses to actually graze up and down the rocks. And it actually, we can see where the tadpole has been because of these grazing trails that it leaves. So tadpoles play a really important role in the environment by keeping our waterways clean because they, they eat algae. Um, and so amphibians as a group are really very important because they are right in the middle of the food chain. So the tadpoles play their role in the water, um, but the adult frogs themselves play a very important role, both as a food source, so many other things eat frogs, um, even other frogs, reptiles, many birds, and even in some places, humans rely on frogs to eat, as we've seen with the Goliath frog. And then on the other hand, frogs eat a huge number of insects, and so they play an important role in pest control, they eat our mozzies and our flies, and if we were to lose frogs, um, you can just imagine the explosion of insects that might happen. One of the things I also get asked a lot, um, and it's quite a common belief about frogs, is are they poisonous? It's Some are, but there is nothing in South Africa that is going to make you ill, and certainly nothing in South Africa that will, will harm or, or kill you. So, for example, the toads, we've spoken about them having this glandular bumpy skin, those glands actually produce a bit of a toxin. So if you were to pick up a toad, you might feel um, it's quite sticky and see this milky substance that they produce. Um, but for you to touch it, it's fine. Wash your hands afterwards. If you were to probably lick the toad or lick your hand afterwards, it would probably taste quite bitter. But again, nothing that's going to hurt you as a human. You may see um, small dogs frothing at the mouth after they've tried to eat toads. And that's exactly why toads produce this, is to try and get things to not eat them. Some of our frogs are brightly colored uh, and you know, they're actually pretending that they're poisonous by using those bright colors. So this little chap in the middle, the painted reed frog, is very brightly colored, but they're not toxic at all. Um, the banded rubber frog that we get up in Zululand, that is probably South Africa's most toxic frog. Uh, very interesting, you can see this is raised up, uh, they actually run rather than hop. Um, I was fortunate to see one a few weeks ago in Zululand and I picked it up to save it uh, getting squashed on the road. And again, as long as you wash your hands, the worst thing that would happen would be if you had to actually eat some of the, the secretions on the skin. It might make you feel a bit woozy, but there is nothing uh, in South Africa that's going to kill you. We spoke about South America having all those frogs. That's where the really um, toxic frogs are. So this golden poison dart frog from South America is the world's most toxic frog. And the toxins from its skin can, can kill people. Um, and so they got their name because um, the indigenous uh, people there would actually use those toxins uh, on, their, on their arrowheads uh, and, and hunt with those. But there is nothing. Uh, near as toxic in, in South Africa. In fact, some of these toxins have proven really important uh, in terms of human medicine, and there's a lot of research that is done on this. Um, and there's been all sorts of medicines that have been derived from um, the compounds in frog skin. And so each frog, uh, or each species of frog, has an amazing pharmacy literally on its own back that protects it from being eaten, protects it from infections. Um, and so, for example, the Australian uh, tree frog has been shown to com completely inhibit HIV infection. Um, and so there's this incredible research that's happening. Um, and we don't have to kill frogs to find out what uh, compounds they have in their skin. Uh, frogs secrete these naturally. And so what researchers are trying to do is actually recreate some of these uh, potential medicines in the lab. So I mentioned uh, amphibians as a group are now the most threatened um, animals on the planet. We can see here that 41% of our amphibians around the world are threatened with extinction. Um, and so this is higher than any of the other groups that have been assessed. And this is really because of the dependency and direct impact that amphibians face uh, through destruction of their habitat, pollution, so there's all kinds of things 
threats facing amphibians around the world. So using habitat to wetlands, for example, uh, pollution of those habitats is creating um, direct loss of amphibians, but also we're seeing some terrible deformities happening, uh, roadkill and fragmenting of habitat. Um, all of these things often working together. Um, and one of the main threats facing frogs um, you can't really see him, a little chap in the background. Uh, he's infected with amphibian chytrid, which is a fungal disease, which is really a frog pandemic. Um, and it's been around for about 20 years, and it's been a big problem that amphibian researchers have really been working to try and combat. And so while we are all in the grasp of the, the COVID uh, pandemic currently, the amphibians have been facing a similar pandemic themselves for the, the last few decades. Um, so the frogs are saying to us today, um, thank you for joining us in hibernation at home. Um, and and we, we, we understand what you're going through. So essentially, healthy environments means healthy frogs mean healthy humans. And, and that's our take home message through the work that we are doing at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And we operate um, around the country. We focus on several threatened species to implement conservation around South Africa. And so um, we look at things like habitat protection. So actually formally declaring um, nature reserves um, for very threatened species. Uh, this is the team that I am very fortunate to work with. And as you can see from the species map, uh, these guys are themselves distributed around the country. And we also rely very heavily on, on research with universities. Um, and so we've got quite a big team working in the Threatened Amphibian Program to implement uh, conservation for our threatened species, which then of course has knock-on effects for other species and habitat. So how can you help uh, in your own way? Um, there's lots of things that you can do, really anything positive that you do for the environment, like cutting down on your plastic utilization, that kind of thing. You know, often this ends up in our freshwater systems. And the loss of habitat is the biggest threat facing frogs. So you can even create some habitat in your own gardens, uh, create a garden pond, um, and have indigenous plants. Um, all of these things go a long way. Uh, and you're very welcome to get hold of me on more tips on how to do this. And really the first thing to do is learn more about your frogs. Um, these are not animals to be afraid of. They are really interesting. They are really diverse. Uh, and hopefully through this talk, um, you found it to be quite fascinating. So we have many educational resources. And again, you're welcome to get hold of me. Uh, we have regional posters for the entire country. We've got 13 posters uh, on different regions for South Africa. Uh, there's a children's book that includes a CD of the frog calls. Uh, and based on that book, there's also an app that's full of interactive games and learning, which might be useful at the moment. So again, get hold of me um, about that. That's for kids. There is also a, an app and complete guide for frogs um, for, for adults as well. So thank you all very much for listening. Um, there is my, my email address if you'd like to get hold of me. And, um, and, and our website also has some of those resources. All right, thank you. I'm going to have a look now to see what questions we have. Okay, so um, I'm going to just run through them from the top. Um, so the first question is from Paul, and he says, um, why are frogs held out as one of the early markers of ecological or biodiversity crisis and decline? All right, so we did touch on that. Um, so because frogs are so sensitive to changes in the environment, and that's because of them using both the water and the land during, during their life cycle, they're sensitive to changes in both of those systems, the fresh water and the terrestrial ecosystems. They're very sensitive because they have these semi-permeable skins, uh, and so they're sensitive to, to any pollutions or contamination um, that they can be affected through their skin. So really, we call them bioindicators. They show us the health of the environment. And the fact that 41% um, of this entire group of animals around the planet 
is declining shows us that our world is not as healthy as it, as it should be. And then Marilyn asks, what do we call floating frog eggs? Um, I'm not sure that there's any special technical name for that other than, than floating eggs. So we saw different frogs have, have different mechanisms for laying the eggs and some will, will float on the water like that. Laura asks, which species take up to two years to complete their metamorphosis and what would the advantage of the slow metamorphosis be? Uh, that's a great question. So we see this in um, species that are in colder climates um, and species that are also more associated with permanent water bodies. So where species have to develop very quickly, for example, the bullfrogs, where it's only for um, a couple of weeks that they have access to water, that metamorphosis will be very quick. Things like the table mountain ghost frog that we're studying um, in, in, on Table Mountain in Cape Town, that can take up to two years. And so they have almost permanent access to water um, and they take a bit longer. Other species up in the Drakensberg, for example, where it's cooler, also take, take a longer time. Okay, then Marissa asks, what uh, chytrid effect, does chytrid affect any South African species? Um, so there is a, a research group at Potchefstroom really looking very closely at this question. Um, I did my PhD looking at whether the chytrid fungus affects our threatened species. Um, and so certainly chytrid is here, the fungus is here, and many of our species are affected or infected with it. But this infection is of a very low prevalence and we're not seeing mass die-offs in South African species that we see in other parts of the world like South America and Australia for example. Um, one of the theories behind this is that the, the fungus has actually evolved or originated in Africa and so our species have a more uh, immunity to it um, but it may also have things to do um, with climate um, and things like that. So, uh, we're not seeing detrimental effects caused, caused by, by chytrid. Okay, um, sure, we've got lots of questions. Um, and then Marissa also asks, are any South African species being studied for medicine? Um, so again, the group at Potch um, are, are looking at some of these compounds, um, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with uh, Prof. Shea Weldon there um, around that. Um, and then Jackie asked if we can play the, the frog sounds again. So Jackie, actually we have um, a YouTube video um, with all the frog sounds um, and I happily will send you the link to that, that YouTube video. Arista asks which South African species are most endangered? Um, so at the moment we have about um, 20% of our species are, are listed as threatened. Um, and a couple of those are critically endangered and we are working on the Table Mountain Ghost Frog, which is critically endangered. We'll also be starting a project on other Western Cape species, including um, the Rough Moss Frog, which is also critically endangered. We work on the Amatola Toad in the Eastern Cape, which is critically endangered. So there are quite a few critically endangered species in South Africa and endangered, um, spread across KZN uh, and the Western Cape primarily. Uh, that we're looking at. Hi John, uh, you say, do you think it'll be worth exploring the value of amphibians as a food source for people in South Africa? Uh, ultimately, can be supported through government biodiversity economy initiative. That's an interesting question. Um, and so generally, from a conservation perspective, we um, don't promote eating of, of frogs. Um, there are um, countries where there are frog farms and you know, in parts of the world, Frogs do form a very big part of, of the, the diet of people. So I think if we um, were able to do this in a sustainable way, in a way that didn't impact directly on wild populations, and we had a species that um, was actually able to provide a reasonable amount of food, um, you know, many of our frogs are, are very small, and so you'd have to really have a huge number to, to make it worthwhile. So it's not something that, that I've looked into, certainly, um, and also importing frogs around the world as part of what's caused the chytrid fungus to spread. So it's something that would have to be looked at quite, 
quite carefully. Okay. Um, Jackie asked if people are allowed to keep frogs. So, great question because frogs are super cool and interesting. But again, we don't promote um, people um, actually keeping frogs as pets. Again, it links to you know, transporting frogs, taking them out of the wild, often associated with disease. So while there are some zoos uh, and a shark and marine, uh, marine world, for example, dangerous creatures, they have frogs on display. By all means, go and have a look at those. But we would uh, definitely not recommend that you, you keep frogs as pets, although some people do. Okay. Um, Mia asks, what is my favorite frog? Uh, that's a great question. It's very hard for me to choose. So I love the tree frogs um, and they have big red eyes and they, they're pretty relaxed. Uh, but I think out of the threatened species, my favorite frog is, is the kloof frog. Uh, and you will have been able to see, if you live near kloof, all those wonderful murals that, that Giffy, the street artist, has painted on the kloof frog. So you can go and see, see what those look like. Mesfin asks, why do frogs croak? Um, and so this is about that advertisement call that we spoke about. It's the male frogs calling the females to the breeding site. So that's why they croak. Um, and yes, I'll certainly share uh, the, the YouTube, YouTube links to anyone who, who wants them. Um, Babashni asks if it is legal to hunt frogs for food by local communities. Um, it's not illegal as far as I know, and as far as I know, in some areas, uh, things like the bullfrogs are actually um, eaten uh, in places in Mpopo, um, but it's also quite rare that we find that people are in fact interested in, in eating frogs. Again, it's not something that we would, would recommend. Okay. Um, Quentin, uh, he says he was wondering about the flashy colourful frogs in South Africa and if there are not any poisonous uh, frogs in South Africa. Um, so I did touch on that, so our most colourful frogs are the painted reed frogs. Um, there's a huge variety of colours and patterns in this uh, species, uh, stripy, pink uh, limbs um, and spots, dots, you name it. Uh, they really have incredible um, diversity in terms of their color, but they're not poisonous. So they're one of the ones um, that basically mimics having poison, um, but, but they're not poisonous. Um, yeah. Okay, Takana asks if there is a Johannesburg group of some kind already assisting, sorry, these things are jumping around, uh, with counting, clearing wetlands and so on. Um, so Takano, we are now based uh, in, in Midrand and we're working quite closely with the various conservancies there who are very active, especially around the bullfrogs uh, and are looking at potentially rehabilitating and reintroducing bullfrogs. So if you're at all in the Midrand area, um, you know, once things are up and running, and of course, I forgot to say frogs in general breed during, during the summer months. Um, and so that's when things are really active. Um, but Yes, certainly um, get hold of me and we can have a look at where you might be able to help. Okay. Um, Emma asked if there's any relocation programs happening with endangered frogs. So um, I just answered that a bit in terms of, of the bullfrog work. We are, are looking at that. Um, and then we also work on the Pickersgills reed frog, an endangered frog from, from the KZN coast um, with Johannesburg Zoo, who are, are breeding that species. Uh, and then reintroducing it back into the wild in Durban, and we work in Durban to monitor how those reintroductions are, are working. Um, Ron, if you could just email me um, for, for the, the links uh, and the resources that I've mentioned, I'll happily share those with you. And Kate uh, wants to know what frog jumps from tree to tree. So um, those are our tree frogs. There's quite a few different tree frogs um, around Africa and the, and the world. And they've got these really long limbs and they've got quite sticky um, hands and feet and that helps them to, to stick onto the leaves as they jump from, from tree to tree. Grace asks, are there any diseases affecting frog numbers? 
I spoke quite a bit about the chytrid fungal disease, and that really is having a huge impact on frogs globally. Um, fortunately, not so badly in South Africa, but certainly around the world, the chytrid fungus is causing some direct extinctions and certainly massive declines in, in frog populations around the world. Hi, Anthony. Um, Anthony asks how prevalent is hybridization in frog populations in South Africa? As a consequence of human action and what is the impact of this on their populations. So there are a few species mostly within the toads that are able to to hybridize. So for example the guttural toad and the raucous toad are able to hybridize um, but then the offspring of that are not viable so they actually can't reproduce themselves. So it's, it's not a, a massive threat in terms of species which are you know, their least concern. Um, but yes, in terms of the, the Cape Platana and the common Platana, there are some concerns there. And then there's also concerns about um, the, the guttural toad moving into Western Cape and whether that might affect the endangered um, uh, toad there. So I think it's still quite early to know. Um, but again, I think that the, the actual hybrids would not be viable and would not be able to themselves. So the indications at this stage is that it's not a massive threat in South Africa. And then Catherine asks if the posters are available in A, A4. Um, and yes, I can um, send you the PDFs for those and you're welcome to print them uh, whatever size uh, you'd like. Um, and then Ronja asks, um, are there any invasive amphibians that threaten local species? So we are fortunate in South Africa where we haven't had massive invasions of frogs from elsewhere. So for example, in Madagascar, there's a big problem um, with I think the Chinese or Asian toad coming in and potentially really threatening the very endemic species that only occur in Madagascar. Uh, in South Africa, the problem is more actually uh, within South Africa. So local species. So for example, the guttural toad that I spoke of uh, moving into Cape Town that's actually been introduced there through, through landscaping uh, and that threatens um, or potentially threatens the western leopard toad which is an endangered species there. Similarly the um, painted reed frogs which are from the east coast of the country have also managed to move into the western Cape and they may be potentially threatening the, the local frogs there. And then Simone asks how do we make a garden uh, more frog friendly apart apart from creating a frog pond. So you really don't need to go out and make a huge pond with amazing filters and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, the first step is having an indigenous water friendly garden, uh, you know, and this in itself attracts the insects that frogs need to eat. So that's your first step. And then even just providing a few watery areas. So even if it's um, a small sort of rock feature that has some water in, um, you also don't want to have ponds or swimming pools um, that are too steep. You know, frogs often fall into pools and can't get out. So you can actually put some netting over the edge of your pool or a floating plank and things like that that frogs can, can get out of. And if you do build a pond, you want to have rocks and lots of um, uh, water-friendly vegetation that can, can, um, can use that. So again, if there's any other questions, you're very welcome to, to email me. Um, and I'm happy, happy to answer those uh, via email. So thank you everyone um, and it's been really great to test out my first uh, webinar and I hope you all learned something and, and enjoyed it and join us for some more of our wild chats going forward. Thanks everyone.